guys haven't been here in a few weeks, but we've been in a series that I call Predicting Our Future. Predicting Our Future. And uh, the first week when I said that, I remember my dad looked at me like, like, oh, Mike's going to talk about prophecy? Uh, I'm not talking about becoming some super spiritual guy who prophesies. What I was talking about, what I was talking about is, is how we all predict the future at times. And when, when I said that week, I said, I said, how many of you guys have ever said, you should have seen that coming? You told your friend, you should have seen that coming because you knew that your friend was going to go broke because every time you went out, she spent 150 bucks on her credit card. Or you knew your friend was going to get fat because every time you went out, he was eating 10 bags of chips. So then when they're like, I can't believe I'm broke, you're like, you should have seen that coming. Everybody saw it but you. Like, I can't believe I gained 30 pounds. Really? Because even the waiter told you you ate a lot last time we went out to eat. Like, <laughs> like you can't, so everybody's predicting your future but you. So what I talked about was, yeah. was that too many of us say, you should have seen that coming. But we never say, I should have seen that coming. We never want to admit that it was our problem. So uh, when we talked about this thing called the principle of the path. And the principle of the path basically says that <coughs> direction determines destination. So that if you're eating too much, you're going to get fat. If you're, you're on the path, if you're on the path to this place, you're going to end up at this place. So why is it that your friends can see that you're going that you're going on that path, but you seem to not see it. Why is it that you can see what they can see, they can see, but and they you can see what they can't see, and you, they can see what you can't see. And what we talked about that week is basically Matthew seven. Jesus talks about about worrying about the speck in your neighbor's eye when you have a log in yours, and. Uh, so the problem is, is, the reason that we see their future and not ours is that we judge others more harshly than we judge ourselves. When we talk about not judging, about not judging. So the, the reason, so we talk about not judging, but we too, last week, I added something to the principle of the path and, I, and I, we talked about it's direction, not intention that determines direction, not intention, that determines your destination. And I talked about how sometimes we tend to want to get to this destination, that's our intention, but we end up over here because we're on the wrong path. So we talked about how we, how we don't intentionally go to the wrong path, and we don't even know we're doing it, so how do I get on the right path when I don't even know I'm on the wrong path? Well, it's not that, it's not that we accidentally, we need to avoid this. We need to avoid the wrong path. Avoid the, we avoid unintentionally, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'll give you the answer is this. We avoid unintentionally doing the wrong thing by intentionally <coughs> doing the right thing. We avoid unintentionally doing the wrong thing by intentionally doing the right thing. So what I talked about, and I gave, you, I gave an example, I said, I said, if you want to pay your house off first, but you keep eating too much cheeseburgers, what you do is when you get your check, you pay that house payment right away. You send that extra money to the house, and then you don't have it to buy those cheeseburgers. So you, you avoid doing the wrong thing by doing the right thing. That's how we avoid this unintentional stuff. But direction, not intention, determines your destination. And then we talked about it. We can predict our future. This week, week three, I want to add two more ways we can predict our future. <coughs> two more ways. One of the other ways we can predict our future is by predict is by reading God's promises. And I'm that pastor. I almost every week, I almost go every week. Every week I almost tell you guys, you have to read the word of God. I don't go 
one week without plugging that in somewhere. I almost never go a week without telling you guys, you have to study the word. So this is my way of telling you this week. You have to study God's promises. God's promises are going to get us to be able to read or predict our future. Let me give you some of God's promises. Proverbs 22, 6, and this is my favorite, and this is the one that hit me. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So it's telling you, you put your kid on the right path. If you put him on the path going to that door, he's going to end up at that door, not that door. <laughs> you can predict your future by how you raise him, by what you tell them to do, by bringing them to church by showing them that God is number one, by teaching them the ways of the Lord. You can predict your kid's future by how you raise them. It's a promise from God that if you raise them right, they're going to end up right. This even furthers the principle of the path. If we're headed north on a path, you will always end up north. If you head south, if you show your kids that church isn't important, then they're going to think it it's, isn't important. If you show them that it's, it's a convenience thing and you only go when it's convenient, they're going to go when it's convenient. They will end up being adults that serve, the kind of, serve God the way that you serve God. You can predict your future. So basically, guys, I know I have a lot of people in line with little kids Guys, if you have kids, you need to show them that God is number one, that God is the best, that God is the greatest. You have to put them on the right path if you want them to live the right path. Direction determines destination every single time. So here's another promise. <coughs> this one is Psalms 37, 4. It says, Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. When you're going through a hard time, when finances are just not right, when you have stumbled, maybe sinned, so far away from your dream, it seems impossible to make it there. You can predict that you're going to be okay, because here God promises that he's never going to leave you, that he's always there, even when you stumble, even when you fail, even when you mess up, God is there. That the Lord will hold your hand. That's what he does. And his promises are the same yesterday, today, and forever. They're always going to come true. He always finishes what he starts. This week, has Andy started heading down, down, down? I mean, they were lowering his, the ventilator from 100 down to 60. I thought God is starting something. And I wanted to tell his family, if he starts it, he's going to finish it. Because if he starts it, he's going to finish it. It's what God does. So as a pastor, I'm like, what scripture can I give them? And I dug, 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 and nothing, nothing felt right to tell them except this. God finishes what he starts and nothing shows us more than that than his last words to us. It is finished. It is finished. If he can finish the hardest death of all time, he can finish your problem. He can finish taking you to your destination, your dream. God is bigger than it all. He always finishes. It's Christ's last words to us. It's finished. Because I finished things. It's like he's saying, I finished things, guys. Look at this. If I finish this, I can finish anything. The next promise I have here is <coughs> Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. And it says, <coughs> The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. It says, in your darkest hour, you can rest assured that things are going to turn out okay. Paul says, joy comes in the morning. It's so weird. I heard that scripture my whole life. 
And this week I had to look back at it and say, does it say morning? M-O-R-N-I-N-G, like the sun rises in the morning. Or does it say morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, because I'm mourning because I'm having a hard time. I'm crying. Some, maybe someone died or something. I had to check it for myself. But either way, God comes in the morning and God comes in the morning. And that scripture tells us that his promises are new every day. Every day he's going to be there for us. So we can predict our future and know that tomorrow is going to be okay because we have a God who's going to, who's going to provide. A God who is going to give us new promises tomorrow. Lamentations. It's really hard to say. Allison has a speech issue, if you guys didn't know. But she goes to Gabe's church on Wednesday nights, and they're teaching them the, the books of the Bible. If you get her after church, make her tell you she's really proud. But she can't seem to say Lamentations or Deuteronomy. So don't make fun of her. Just laugh at her. <laughs> but... but um, yeah, so I don't know why I do that for free, but talk to my daughter, it will make your day. Uh, so, the next promise I have here, <coughs> come, it says Proverbs 1, 1, 2, 3. <laughs> come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you and make you wise. Man, this scripture is really, really good, and if I could just give it to you, and like Pastor Mike's version. I would love to give it to you in Pastor Mike's version. The PMV. You can't buy it. It's not published yet. But it's going to be one day. The scripture, Proverbs 1, 23. Come listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you. And make you wise. So, Pastor Mike's version is, If you're stupid, if you're dumb, if you're an idiot, pray to God. Like, listen to his counsel. And he'll make you wise. That's what, that's what it says. If you're stupid or dumb, come to me. I'll help you make the right decisions. So you can rest assured that your stupidity isn't going to affect your life. Your stupidity isn't going to make you go down a wrong path if you listen to his counsel. So his counsel is going to put you on the right path. God is greater than your stupidity. God is greater than anything, any mistake you can ever make. And you can predict your future and knowing that if you listen to him, things are going to turn out okay. Proverbs 123. You can be smart. You can make better decisions. You can get on the right path if you listen to his counsel. In fact, let's read another promise about wisdom because that one's about wisdom. This one says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without fault, without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So if you want wisdom, to, if you ask God for wisdom, you can predict that in the future you're going to be wise. It might not be tomorrow, you might, but eventually you're going to end up wise. You can predict that. The next one I have is, this one, if you want fruit, if you want to win souls, you can predict your future that you're going to win souls. You want fruit in your life. Abide in Him. And it's John 15, 3. It says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear, the fruit, bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. So it tells you, you can predict your future. If you abide in me, if you live my rules, if you follow me, if you worship me, you're going to be fruitful. You can predict your future. If you do this, you're on the path to being fruitful. If you don't water the tree, it's never going to bear fruit. But if you water it and you fertilize it and you take care of it, they will bear fruit. You can predict the tree's future by how you take care of it. And your fruit is the same way. The next one says, if you are a loving, caring person in the name of Jesus, you will be, you will be rewarded. And that's uh, Mark 9, 41. It says, if anyone gives you even a cup of water because you belong to the Messiah, I tell you the truth, that person will surely be rewarded. 
So that if you take care of people who need to be taken care of, then just because they're a child of God, and whether they're Denny Bryant or not, they're a child of God. If you take care of them and you love them just because you love Jesus and they're Jesus' kid, he's going to reward you. And it might not be here. I don't want to preach prosperity and all this great stuff. I don't want to sound like one of those guys. But maybe your rewards are going to be in heaven, but rest assured you will have rewards if you just love people. You can predict your future by following his, his rules, his promises. He doesn't just give you a promise. He doesn't just say you will be rewarded or you'll be rewarded if. He doesn't just say your promises come in the morning. Your promises will come in the morning if. It's, there's so many ifs. We have to follow the ifs. We have to be intentional. Being intentional is the best way to predict our future. I could go on. There are promises after promises in God's word. They tell you that if you do this, you will have this. If you walk this path, this will happen. If you do what the Bible tells you, you can predict your future. Because God doesn't break promises. God doesn't break promises. Psalms 89, 34 says, I will not violate any covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. He says, I don't break my promises. I don't break my promises. Anything I say, you can rest assured it's going to happen. There's so many promises, guys. You can predict your future because you know that God's not going to break his promises. If he promised it, you can bet it's going to happen. I don't know Tom Brady, personally, but if God told him he's going to win today, then he's going to win today. God makes prom God doesn't break his promises. And it's the Super Bowl. And I don't know who's going to win. I don't, I don't know. But God knows. And if he told somebody, then they're gonna, it's going to happen. They're going to be successful. So, going to happen. You can rest assured. The, ne the next way we can predict our future is through prayer. So that's the first one was you hold on to his promises. You can predict the future by holding on to his promises. The next one is through prayer. So I'm not that prosperity guy who's going to stand up and tell you God's going to make you rich. I'm not that guy who's going to tell you that kind of stuff. I don't preach that every week. God's blessings are true. And God is real. And God does answer prayers. But it's just not something I preach every week. I don't feel like that's the meat of the word of God. But I do believe he wants the best for us. I believe he answers our prayers. It's in the Bible over and over again. And I'm telling you, church, if you call yourself a Christian, you have to you have to believe the entire book. You can't pick and choose. It's the bread of life is Jesus. The word of God is the bread of life. But too many of us pick it and eat it like it's a buffet. And we're full. And oh, I got so much scripture to give you. But here's the thing. We ate the steak and we left the meatloaf. Like... We, we ate all the really, really, really good stuff, but the Brussels sprouts are still at the, at the buffet, right? Like, ah, uh, that, that's not for me. We eat all we eat our favorites, and we pick our favorites, and we can quote our favorites, and we remember our favorites, and we remember when, when pastor preached on this, but that one, ooh, I didn't like that one too much. So we, tr we, we treat our Bible like a buffet, and we pick and choose what we want and what we don't want, and we just can't do that. We have to believe all of them. So if you believe all of them, you believe that prayer is powerful and prayer changes things. Yeah, I'll eat the steak of those Brussels sprouts. No. Like a kid at dinner time, Allison will come up and say, did I eat enough? You didn't touch your vegetables, but you ate all your meat. 
If they know that, if they ask Carrie, Carrie will say, yeah, good, good girl, you learned all you need. Or if they ask me, well, then you need all of it. You need all of it. <laughs> and so they go to Carrie, because Carrie seems to be a little nicer about it. But we can't be like, Matthew's a good book, but, but John, John talked about love way too much. That's not my thing. I ain't hugging strangers. Like, don't ask me to hug a homeless man. I'm not doing it, so I'm not going to read John because John's just too much about love. Like, that's how we do it. I, I love John, but the book of John, but he got a little crazy in the book of Revelation. Like, I'm not going to, that's not for me. Let's talk about like lions and, and helicopters and weird, weird stuff. I don't know about that one. That's how we read the Bible. We just can't do it. We have to believe it all. If you want to call yourself a Christian, you must believe that prayer works. So if you believe prayer works, then your prayers are answered because the, prayer, the answers of prayer comes from faith. So if you believe it, it's going to happen. It's all about your faith, though. And that's why I talk so much about the buffet and what we choose. And we just have to believe it all. John said it like this in John 5.14. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in, we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So John says, I have enough confidence. I believe in him enough that anything I ask, he's going to give it to me. He, not, John doesn't say that. John says, anything I ask, he hears us. <laughs> so John says that, that I have enough confidence that he's going to hear us. And if God hears us, he's going to give it to us. If it's the best thing for us. If it's the best thing for us. That doesn't mean he always gives it to us. So you say, but Mike, how is that brand new truck not better than that junk I'm driving right now? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm telling you, God has you in that junk for a reason. Maybe, maybe if you get that brand new truck, your head gets a little too big. And you end up in the hospital because of a swollen head. But I don't know. There's some reason God hasn't given you that truck. Maybe it's because you don't need your Brussels sprouts. Yeah. I don't know. But, so John tells us that God hears us. And if God hears us, we know we're going to get it if it's the best for us. And then John tells us, let's go back to promises. John says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. <laughs> Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So John's telling us here that whatever you ask, I'll do it if it glorifies the Father through Jesus. If it glorifies the Father. One more scripture from John. I'll show you. That one more scripture, and then I'll show you some more of that to show that it's not just John that tells you prayer words. John 16, 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. <clears throat> it's his desire that you have joy. God wants us happy. So he wants to answer our prayers. So John tells us to ask, and you will receive. Well, here's the thing with John's scriptures that I pulled out. John's scriptures seem to all be about God. God's going to give it to us. God's going to provide. God's going to do it through Jesus. God's doing it. God, God, God. That's how John was. But we all have different personalities, right? So when we, I find that Matthew and Mark and Luke, they give it a little differently. And God's going to give it to you if you do your part is what Matthew and Mark and Luke tend to say. But John, and it's sometimes we get so, so stuck up on John's that don't tell us that we have to do anything. Because it's a lot better to say, you're going to get a new truck if you sit on your butt, or you're going to get a new truck if you work on it, if you work for it. So we always want to read John's scriptures, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all have different ones. I'll read Mark 7, 7. <coughs> Ask, and it will be given to you, Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. I want to point out a difference in John's scriptures and some other books in the Bible. 
Here it is. Matthew tells us, ask, and it will be given to you. That's where John would have sought, it seems to me. John would have sought that ask, and it will be given to you. God isn't a genie in a bottle that just gives you whatever you ask for. Matthew adds, seek, and you will find. <coughs> it's like this. If I ask God for a college degree, I will not have a college degree tomorrow. Like, it doesn't work that way. If I ask God, so ask, that's the first part. If I ask God for a college degree, that's just the first part. Now I need to seek it out. To seek it out, I would say that I need to, I need to go to college. I need to go find a college and pick one. And then I need to file for financial aid because I can't pay for it, or scholarships, or however I'm going to pay for this, grants. I need to seek out all that stuff. So Matthew tells us, ask, but then do your part. Ask, but then seek out how you're going to get it. Like, you can't, the, the college degree is going to plop down in my lap. So ask, then seek. Matthew says it's so important that it's, you don't just ask. You have to seek. You have to seek out all that information. But then Matthew doesn't end at just seeking. Because I could pick the college, and I could apply for all the paperwork, and I could seek out all that financial aid. I could ask God, and I could seek all that out. But then Matthew says this. He says, knock. And then, what's it say? Just thought it was an act. It says, knock, and it will be open to you. And this is when the door opens, when you knock. And knocking requires energy. It requires me to forcefully pick up my hand and knock on the door. Like, you're not going to know I'm there until I knock, right? Like, unless you have a ring doorbell, that thing's annoying, by the way. I'll talk to you about that later. But uh, you got to knock. Knocking requires action. It requires effort. I have to pick up my hand. We'll continue with the college example. If I have asked God and sought all that, saw all the answers I need, now I actually have to go to class. I actually have to put some effort into it. I have to study. I have to put, I have to go to go, I have to do my homework. I have to do all of this stuff. I have to stay moving in the right direction because what? Direction determines destination every single time. Every single time. So asking, according to Matthew, asking is just not enough. It's just not enough. We have to do our part, is what God tells us. And so many times, so many people leave God. They leave church. They leave this world because, well, I asked God and he didn't answer You gotta do your part. God's gonna help you get through it. He's gonna give you the strength. He's gonna give you the encouragement through people and through His Word. But you have to do your part. Matthew goes on and he says this. He says that whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So you can ask and pray and seek God. But if you don't believe he's going to do it, he's not going to do it. If you have faith. If you have faith, faith is the important part. Matthew tells me, I have to believe. If I fail to believe in God and myself, I'm never going to graduate. I'm never going to get that degree. I use college as an example, but let me tell you, you can apply Matthew's rules of prayer to everything in life. I want to fix my marriage requires more than just asking God. I want to lose weight requires more than just asking God. I want a, I want a new car, a new house, a new insert here. It requires all of these steps. Matthew isn't the only one though. James tells us that we have to ask right. We have to ask right. James says, 
You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So, so many times we get confused with prayer. We think it's like that genie and we just rub it and out pops this big blue guy. Or black guy, I guess, is the new Will Smith, the new version. But, um, can't do that. You have to do your you have to do your own stuff. Remember in the if you ever watched Aladdin, the genie he rolls in, he says, and the genie says, I can't make someone fall in love with you. And he says, Well, she's already in love with me. I just need to be a prince because she can only marry a prince. <sighs> so genie makes him a prince. But Aladdin fails miserably, and it doesn't work out. Aladdin still has to do his own work. That's kind of the same way. We have to do our own work. We have to do our own work. It's so important. James 4 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. Just spend it on your own passions. So what are your passions? You're asking for things that are just worldly happiness. God wants to give you things that will affect eternity. God's about eternity. It's so much bigger than just the world of passions. <clears throat> Paul tells us like this, and he, he tells the church of Ephesus in Ephesians 6.18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. You know what supplication means? Because I didn't. I've heard the scripture a million times, but I was like, um, if I'm going to talk to my congregation about the scripture, I better find out what supplication means. So I looked it up. I looked it up, and it's really good. Dictionary.com. It's an amazing thing. You just put any word and it pops up a definition. So supplication means this. <clears throat> the action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. So what does Paul say? Paul says, praying all times in the spirit, we know what that means, with all prayer and supplication, with all prayer and begging on your knees, with all prayer and calling out to God, humbly and earnestly. The action of asking or begging for something, earnestly and humbly. When's the last time you begged God for something? Don't be afraid to beg God for something. To get on your knees and humbly tell him, I really want this. I really want this. And your word tells me, God, that you are my Abba Father, my Daddy God. God, so please, as your child, I beg you. And you're crying tears. I admit I can't do it without you, God. I'm desperate. I need you. And I'm talking about tears, not just you're laying in your bed at night and you're like, God, I really like that child. Right? Paul is telling us that we need to beg God. I find myself even failing at this. Even at things I desperately want, I don't seem to want to beg God for them. Carrie's dad is dying in the hospital. I never hit my knees. I sat on my couch and prayed. And I God, please touch John. I'm, why? We, we're afraid to look like a sissy. We're afraid to look bad. We're afraid to look desperate. We have, we're not humble people. And Paul's telling us, you have to be humble and you have to show God that, God, I need you this time. It's real. There's a reason that Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. <clears throat> and we look at it as, oh, he's a sissy. Oh, he cried too much. Paul tells us to do the same thing. If Paul told us to do it, then he probably did it. And I, I am less of a man than Paul was. Paul is a tent builder. And Paul, Paul killed people with stones. I mean, that's manly stuff right there. 
Like, is it right? No, but I think it's cool when I hit an inmate on the floor or something and maybe a tooth got loose. Paul killed people with rocks. Like, he chased people. The whole world was scared of the guy. He was a manly man. And here he is telling us, you need to beg your daddy. You need to beg your God. You need to pray harder than you're praying. If I don't see tears, then you ain't getting it. That's what Paul's telling us here when he says to pray with supplication. When's the last time you begged God to see your kids in church? You begged God to heal a loved one. When's the last time you begged God for anything? When's the last time you begged anything? It's probably why we don't beg God because we don't make a habit of begging. But we need to. God wants to see that we know that we need him. One more scripture out of Matthew in the land. Matthew 7, 11, it says, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? <coughs> Sorry, guys, I still have this little cough and cold. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So if you then know are evil, we're evil, and is that we sin, and we mess up. If we know that it's good to give our kids things. My mom gives me a lot. I'm so glad for my parents. I try to give my kids a lot. Your parents gave you a lot. You give your kids a lot. And we're failures. So if we are what we are, then wouldn't God be, wouldn't God want to give us even more than we give? So Matthew says, think about it. All that you want to give your kids. Think about all that you've given your kids. And then you read that scripture again and it says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven Give good things to those who ask you. Now ask yourself, why haven't I asked God for more? If you're a child of God, why haven't you begged God for more? You are his child. And he wants to give you everything. So if you see your future a certain way, ask him. Then do your part and it, it will happen. I'm telling you, we can see our future because he never breaks a promise and he always answers prayers. He never breaks a promise and he always answers prayers. We just got to pray right and hold on to those promises. Never let go. Oh, man. And when we follow his, when we follow his promises and we pray right, we can predict. Yeah. But we don't want to do that. We want to blame other people. Like we want to blame other people or other things or even blame God. Like I heard a guy at work this week. He said, he said, they're all talking about losing weight. And he said, I've already come to the conclusion that I'm fat, my parents are fat, my grandparents are fat, I'm gonna be fat. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, Hawk. I said, you're fat because you eat too much. Your parents were fat because they ate too much. And your grandparents were fat because they ate too much. It isn't in your blood. It's not your ethnicity. It's not what, it's not what God has given you. It's your path. Right. Your problem isn't your product. Your problem isn't that you're fat. Your, your, your problem is your pattern. Your problem is, is that you eat too much. It's like Carrie tells me that I'm not a morning person. Like it's an ethnicity. Being a morning person isn't the color of your skin. It is not. You can't get up in the morning because you drink coffee late at night. You can't get up in the morning because you wanted to watch one more episode on Netflix. Like you can't get up in the morning because you up too late. So you need to pick what's important for you. Because it's you. 
It's not God. God didn't give you these horrible traits. Nobody wants to get up in the morning. Like, really, nobody. But God didn't give that to you. It's was you do it to yourself. It's the path the path you're on. So I can when Carrie stands up to like watching TV, I can predict in the morning that she's gonna be a bear and she's gonna be hard to wake up. But like you can predict I can predict her future. Yeah. Same thing with me. Like if I don't eat right, if I don't if I don't eat right, study my, and pray every morning. I'm a bear at work. Uh, inmates don't like me. Like from the first walk, I come in without food, and I'm mad and I'm angry, and <laughs> I put them in bad moods and I have a bad day. So I know if I miss breakfast and my prayer time and my study time, that I can have a bad day at work. I can predict my future. God does it for us. He shows us everything. So. We have to pray, hold on to his promises, and do our part. That's how I wanted to, this series was so, so fun. And if you you missed, if you have the internet capabilities and you missed the first two, you have to find them. I really think this was the best, funnest, but most practical series I've ever done. You have to watch it. Watch it. If you guys haven't watched it, watch it. It's so, so good. Not that I'm good, but the scriptures are great. And just everything about it was great. God is amazing. We're going to go ahead and go into communion at this time. Communion. I read a scripture. John 6. And John 6 tells us that whoever eats of this bread... We'll live forever, it says. <laughs> it's funny, if you read the whole book in John, he comes up the bread of life, he comes up the manna from heaven, he comes, <coughs> which is really cool because the manna from heaven was an unending bread. You could eat as much as you want. You knew it was going to be there the next day. And Jesus is that. Like, eat as much as you want. Take in all that you can. I'm going to be here the next day. Like, I am the bread of life. I, I am the bread that if you eat, you will never die. I am. Jesus was that bread. And he was talking about, about spiritual stuff. He wasn't talking about communion here in John 6. He was just talking about how he, he could provide everything forever. He could do it all. He is our bread of life. I don't know if he was gluten free or not. I don't know if he was allergen free or anything like that. Yes, he is. Because he's good for everyone. And Jesus is amazing that way. He's perfect in every way. He is our bread that we can eat and never go hungry. I think that so many times we. We just look at communion like that Isaiah 53 scripture that tells us by his stripes we are healed. Or like when he tells us at the Last Supper. And I don't know why they were all on the same side of the table. And sometimes I think that I have to stand this way because Jesus and the disciples were all facing the same way at the table. So I need to take it this way. You know, that's not even a biblical picture. But Jesus is everything. So many times we think about that last supper, we think about Isaiah 53, and we forget that He is the bread of life. He is manna from heaven that's going to be there tomorrow, that was there yesterday, that's going, that was here today. And we don't need to hog it all up today because we can rest assured that He's going to be there tomorrow. But for some reason, we do. The reason why I eat it up. When we really, really fall in love with God, we want to eat that bread like, like it's not going to be there tomorrow. That's great. That's amazing. But um, all other times, we feel like, oh, it's going to be there tomorrow. I'm going to push it back. Like, it's that man that God's going to provide every day. The bread of life 
it's fulfilling if you eat it one day, but it's satisfying if you eat it every day. So when you're taking Jesus every day, it's better than that one. Every day is better than the day before. So thankful that he is my bread of life. Would you like to listen to him? John 4, there's a, there's a story that we tend to forget sometimes. It's the Samaritan woman at the well. And Jesus is like, hey, can you give me some water to drink? And he, she says, you're a Jew. And I'm a Samaritan. I ain't giving you nothing. I mean, today's lingo would be like, dude, I'm white and you're black. No. Like, that's what it was. Jesus said, if you knew who you were talking to, <laughs> you would give me water. But I'll give you water that's going to last forever. You drink of my water, and you will never go thirsty again. I know it's water, but I kind of think of that as the same liquid here, right? Like his blood, you drink of it, and you never go thirsty. You'll never need, you never want. You can hold on to his promises. You can pray and get things you want. You can do what the Bible says and it's going to put you on the right path. That's the blood. I'm so thankful for the blood. So let's go ahead and take it. So God is good. God is so good. I hope you guys enjoy today's message. It's so practical. Because it tells us that we have to do our part. We can stop blaming other people. Stop blaming generational curses. Stop blaming anything and everything we can blame. And just, just do our part. Hold on to his promises. Keep reading his promises. The more you read them, the, the more you can walk with the confidence that they're true. And the more you pray, the more you see God do. And the more you see him do, the more you want to pray. So it's so fun, but I love you guys, and thanks for coming, and I'll see you next week.